August. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to everyone present here. Uh, welcome to today's episode of Manan, which is a platform for the expression of new ideas and experiences. So today we have with us architects Chavi Lal and Tanya Phillips, who are both graduates of our college, and they're both working in the global design firm Perkins and Eastman. So Perkins and Eastman has been established in India for the past 10 years, and from here, they do a variety of work ranging from large scale master plans, design of campuses for healthcare, higher education, science and technology, senior living, and student housing. Both Shavi and Tanya have been with the firm since the firm started in Mumbai, and they've been instrumental in shaping the work here. To, so, to give a brief introduction of both our speakers today, Shavi is an associate principal at the firm with about 14 years of experience. After graduating from Sir JJ College of Architecture in 2005, she's worked with the uh, renowned architect Christopher Benninger, where she developed her interest in urban design. She studied urban design from Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL, and since she's worked on various projects of varying scales, so the focus of her work is to translate the design vision to deliver experiences by working closely with clients, consultants, and stakeholders. Our second speaker, architect Tanya Phillips, is an associate principal with Perkins Eastman with over 18 years of experience. She's, a graduated from Sir, she's graduated from Sir JJ College of Architecture and has received her master's in architecture from Texas A&M University in the United States. She's a registered architect with the American Institute of Architects. Her area of expertise is health, wellness, and lifestyle. Her project experiences include healthcare, senior living, higher education, and science and technology. Her work in India has been recognized with many awards. She has a passion for writing and has published articles in the interest of health and welfare for the community. The talk today called Global Practice Human by Design looks at the practice areas of higher education and senior living through which we'll understand how the firm approaches design and its integration to the community. Chavi and Tanya will explain, explain through their experience how such projects are designed and delivered. So now without further ado, we'll start uh, Chavi's presentation. And so we're all excited to know what you have to say. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you very much. Um, and so good evening and thank you to Professor Mishra and the Student Council of Sir JJ College of Architecture for inviting us here today. Both Tanya and I are very happy to be here and share our work with the JJ community. Uh, we'd like to congratulate all of you for this fantastic web series, Manan. Uh, not only has it helped uh, students, um, you know, connect with alumni, it has also helped all of us uh, connect with our peers after many years and uh, see the good work that they've been doing. Um, just, you know, in order to save the bandwidth, I'm just going to turn off my video and let the uh, show uh, run. I hope that's all right. We would uh, like to begin with a quick introduction of our firm. Perkins Eastman was founded in the US in 1981, and we are a global practice with multiple offices in the US and four international offices in Guayaquil, Dubai, Mumbai, and Shanghai. Uh, the gray areas on this map that you see are areas we've worked in. The Mumbai team, uh, uh, has been the Mumbai office has been around since 2010, and we are a design studio uh, serving projects in the region. As you can see, we are a young team, and we have had in the uh, past and also currently a few people from JJ. Uh, currently, with us, uh, we have Manjri Paprikar, who works out of the New York office, uh, Chinmay Patel, and Savin Fernandez, who are here in the Mumbai studio. Oh, sorry, I'd like to just, you know, my slideshow is giving me some trouble. I'm sorry, just bear with me. I'm just trying to.
Sorry, I think the slideshow has been giving some trouble, so I'm gonna run it in the slide mode itself. No problem. Um, yeah, sorry. So moving on. So we are a diverse group of people in the Mumbai studio and we indulge in a lot of activities here in the office. The lower left image is uh, all of us with our chairman in front of our office building. Uh, he loves to be in India and before the pandemic used to visit us at least three, four times a year. We are located very close to college um, at Ford in the Sterling Cinema Lane. So we would love to have you guys come over. Uh, before the pandemic, we used to have open house sessions for architecture school students where we invite them, show them our work. They interact with our team and look around our studio. Uh, the top left image is of one of those sessions. Uh, being in Fort, it gives us a lot of opportunity to step outdoors for outdoor sketching sessions. So we do a lot of that. Um, and here's an image of uh, uh, activity we did with a nonprofit organization, uh, helping students uh, with disabilities understand a form, shape, colors uh, through origami. Uh, and this is our team on a small uh, trip to Alibag on uh, one of the years when people could still travel around. Uh, so we are happy to have received some recognition for the work we've done um, in India. The first one is India Property Awards uh, um, for Senior Citizen Community Living Project. Uh, this was given to Virtuoso Senior Living Community. This is a project that Tanya will be explaining in her part of the presentation later today. Uh, we received the ACREX Hall of Fame for our project, Indian School of Business in Mohali. And we also received recognition from World Urban Forum last year at Abu Dhabi. This was for a um, bridge studio that we conducted with Kamla Raheja students, uh, which designed a part of the Mumbai Portlands uh, looking at sustainable development goals. So human by design is the ethos by which we approach all our work. We put human experience in the forefront of design for a project of any scale and consider project successful only when communities belonging to them are productive, happy and healthy. We believe in a one form approach. So teams for a project are based on the expertise required for it and not the location. This makes a thousand plus people firm very close knit. The expertise is developed by a broad and deep uh, understanding of a subject through experience and research. This informs our work and we design spaces that impact human behavior. We believe in sharing this knowledge through dialogue and mentoring within the firm and beyond. Uh, today's talk will follow a very uh, uh, simple agenda where Tanya and I would introduce ourselves and talk a little bit about the work we do, followed by a conversation that would be open to all of us. So I will begin. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Chavi and uh, Shruti introduced me briefly. Um, you know, so my work focuses on large scale and educational projects. Uh, I believe my work contributes in making communities where people can bond and have collective experiences. I am engaged in writing and research on relevant topics within these areas. I try to involve myself in with academia through crits and studios as much possible. I also take up mentoring through nonprofit organizations and within the firm to share my experiences and learning with younger people in the profession. Today, we will look at a project in which uh, the firm and I personally have been involved for many years. Uh, this is Ashoka University. Ashoka University is one of the first private liberal arts universities in India. It is located north of Delhi in Sonipat at Rajiv Gandhi Education City, which is an educational hub set up by Haryana government. 
The client wanted a fully residential campus as it is away from Delhi. And they wanted the project to be rooted in the Indian context. This was just about the brief that was given to us. So the campus is located over two sites. We started work on the South Campus in 2011. And uh, we are now wrapping that up and have started designing the North Campus. Here are just some quick facts and figures that will help you understand the scale of the project. I've now run through some imagery very quickly for you to get a picture of the campus before we run through the process. So you'll understand these images a little better as I explain further. A design process of a campus as such is influenced and tightly followed by four large components, programming, planning and sustainability, design aesthetic, and community involvement in placemaking. This is not a linear process. We do a lot of back and forth until we finally arrive at the design. We look at each of these in detail to understand how they work and contribute. Programming. Uh, when the client told us they wanted a liberal arts university, the first thing for us to do was to understand what liberal arts is. Liberal arts is a well-rounded learning system that allows students to take up subjects from a gamut of different areas and learn through project, research, collaboration, and engagement. For a curriculum like this and for a residential campus, we established three buckets in which we, we wanted to develop the program that can give students the right experience of learning liberal arts. Live, learn, and play facilitated us and the client to develop the program in a balanced manner. Based on these program elements, we developed detailed area sheets of spaces to maintain efficiency and functionality. These are always driven by human well being and productivity as the space needs to serve its users. The Live, Learn, Play program translates to spaces that can be planned for in the campus. The design of these spaces is informed through our work with other universities and projects around the world, where we understand how such spaces function. So a quick look at understanding some of the spaces that go into the design of a campus as such. Classrooms are no longer an instruction space with a front of class. They are collaborative spaces where the teacher is a facilitator and students learn from peers through interactions. Technology plays an important role in campus. With online learning taking up speed in the pandemic, we have seen how quickly this trend is picking up. Remote learning collaborations with different institutions will continue as technology is becoming more commonplace. So just like architecture, students in a liberal arts university also work together a lot on projects and committee work. And there is a need for collaborative spaces, both formal and informal, where they can work together. Seminars where visiting faculty, industry experts come and share their knowledge are becoming more prevalent to bridge the gap between campus learning and industry skills. Such spaces require many people to interact at the same time. Students and faculty also interact in spaces outside the classroom, where student groups could be assisting a faculty in a project or conducting research together. For faculty and administrative staff, their offices are placed to do their own study, prepare for classes, and engage in interdisciplinary conversations. These spaces are designed considering all space, all trends in workspace design that we see even in corporate offices these days. Faculty also need meeting spaces where all of them at a time or few departments together can come together for meetings. These are obviously flexible spaces that can also serve some of the other functions that we mentioned. 
for students in a residential campus and especially remote from the city like ours food is a big requirement students need a lot of variety in food and spaces that are dependent on food uh, they depend on the campus for all their food needs and food also needs to be healthy and nourishing so design of food spaces is an ongoing conversation in residential campuses students live for about 3 to 4 years in these years they form a community and a bond with their fellow mates they need a lot of spaces apart from living areas where they could uh, come together for recreation or conveniences these spaces need to be carefully designed keeping different personalities in mind some students would want to mingle together all the time whereas some others would want their quieter alone spaces with that understanding of programming when we map out different kind of spaces over the entire campus we see how uh, the components of live learn and play become part of uh, every building one way or the other no building is a single use building uh, this provides the campus with a variety of spaces and makes it a truly 24/7 campus now let's understanding how uh, programming uh, fits into planning and sustainability of the campus as i mentioned we started the design uh, first from the south campus in 2011 master plan options were developed just as how you would do them in college considering all aspects of campus planning principles with dialogue and workshops with the client we chose the spine option which is the left one as the way forward now this option has a clear parta diagram where a central open space has clusters along its length Each cluster has an academic building facing the open space and a courtyard behind which uh, faces the residential building. This becomes a module that can be repeated and allows uh, for it to be built in phases and provide incremental growth of functions as the university requirements increase. as this plan evolved uh, the final massing of the south campus was developed as this i'd like to explain the master plan a little more in detail here so as you can see there is a central green open space uh, that we call the mall this open space uh, has academic buildings on all uh, sides of it uh in the outer ring are residential buildings and uh the two bookends of the campus are a large sports center on the north and an administration building on the south the campus was developed from south to north uh such that each phase felt complete now if you look closely the parta diagram that we spoke of has remained where the central green has an academic building followed by a courtyard and followed by the residential building as we were in the last phase of the design of the south campus the client acquired another plot of land north of the site and asked us to expand the campus northward Now our biggest challenge was to create a new place that draws the community from this campus to the new campus. So some strategies that we considered for this expansion are one uh, is to look at open spaces and pedestrian routes in the south campus and expand them northward so that movement is easy and desirable. The second thing to do was to create a heart of the campus. which is essentially providing a reason for people who are living in the south campus to come to the north campus the third is to is that when both campuses are developed there will be a substantial number of student and faculty community over the two campuses when that happens and because this is a remote location 
there is the need for a town center where dining, entertainment, leisure, shopping, events, everything can coexist. This town center is planned to cap off the campus at the north end. So the master plan process was iterated like that of the south campus, but this time around, we were always looking at the south campus alongside the north campus, as that was our immediate context to which we had to respond to and see how the two campuses can relate to each other. Some of the ideas that were found to be more feasible and appealing to the group, that is the clients and us, were developed further until we came up with the design for the North Campus. So this is a final master view of the North Campus. Now let's understand this master plan a bit more in detail. Okay, so there is a central open space here as well, but because it's curvy linear here, um, the nature and scale and character of this open space is very different from that, that of the South Campus. In this case, we have planned all academic buildings on the east side, such that students living in either of the campuses can easily access the academic buildings as they may need to come here for classes. Residential is planned here in clusters and each cluster has its own dining and amenity facilities. Uh, developed over three different phases, the three clusters can have different amenities and different dining options that creates a lot of variety in the campus. And at uh, any point, it is just a crossover from academic areas. So it's very easy to go grab lunch or grab a bite. The North End uh, has a mega block and this that we spoke of earlier is a combination of uh, performing arts spaces, visual arts studios, indoor games, uh, sports facilities that move out to the fields beyond. And this serves as the town center for both campuses. Sustainability is an integral part of the design process and has been a big focus from our clients as well. So when we started looking at the new campus, the mandate given to us was to make it a net zero campus. This is a tall order and we have been working very closely with consultants uh, and design teams to see how we can make this a success. So the first thing for us to do was to lay out what are the standards, what are good practices, and what are best practices, and where our South Campus lay between all of these. This was a good learning for us to see how we can better our targets and have targets for the Ashoka North Campus uh, to reach levels of sustainability uh, and exceed efficiency in comfort conditions, air quality, water and waste management. The sustainability approach, much like our design ethos, is driven by human comfort and well-being. We study design at different stages to ensure human experience is not compromised while striving for energy efficiency. We assess the master plan for thermal gains and wind movements. Then we analyze each building for its energy efficiency, especially for HVAC and lighting systems as they are biggest energy components in a building. Rainwater harvesting, gray water recycling, water use optimization techniques are adopted in the overall water balance in the campus. Sewage and wastewater management is another important component. And we are trying to incorporate a wetland reed bed system here uh, to take care of the same. So to achieve net zero, the first thing we did is to look at what renewable sources of energy can be tapped into at the site. Unfortunately for us, solar is the only viable option here. We didn't have access to geothermal or wind energy. So we studied the solar potential that is available on site, uh, which you see in the top graph here, and then tried to match our energy requirements based on the potential that is there. 
Now, this is a tough task because in order to do this, we had to set benchmarks for every building typology to use up only as much is available in its energy budget to reach this energy balance overall. So here is an understanding of how thermal heat gains on the campus are studied and how we can make outdoor pedestrian experience comfortable. It shows here how road surfaces need shading and where we can optimize the heat by using solar panels on lower levels. This is a study of wind movement through the campus. As you see, we do this study at various levels to see how air moves not only at a pedestrian level, but also at upper levels inside and outside the buildings so we can understand how we can take advantage to provide natural ventilation. The next step is to move to building level strategies where we study how uh, natural ventilation uh, can uh, help us provide transitional spaces and can reduce the load on mechanical HVAC systems. In the bar chart on the right hand side, you will see uh, the energy performance index uh, for a building like this as per ASHRAE standards and how we have tried to uh, work very closely to bring it down uh, to a less than half number such that it contributes to the net zero requirement. Now this is, uh, while doing this, it is also very important to maintain a good indoor air quality as that directly impacts the productivity of the people. And uh, air quality, as many of you may know, is a big concern in the NCR region. The next thing is to look at daylight in buildings. And daylight, again, like air quality, is very important um, contribution to productivity of users. Uh, but what's also important while bringing daylight in is to reduce glare so that interior spaces are well lit. Uh, this has a direct impact on the design of facades and fenestrations. So if you look at this top right diagram, when we conceive the design vocabulary itself, when we get into the look and feel of the building, right from that stage onwards, we get into the study of how this design will perform for daylight. So with that, with that sustainability understanding, we do uh, we want to now move to understanding how this design vocabulary is developed, right? So let's let's see what this design aesthetic is and how we brought that about. So as I mentioned, the only brief that we had received from the client was that the campus needs to be rooted in the Indian context. It needs to be contemporary, but it needs to belong to the region. And we also understand that educational campuses, they have to grace, uh, they have to age gracefully over the years and buildings have to be easy to maintain. So while planning the master plan, we look at built unbuilt spaces both, we study the role of facades in the campus overall, and we identify elements that can help us build up a strategy for the building vocabulary. So the first thing for us to do was to study the academic facade uh, that faces this central model. So while looking at this academic facade, we started from looking at older references of Indian streetscapes and facades to see how such conditions are addressed. Based on those learnings, we created our own facade ideas, which would be suitable for our building typology and orientation. This is how the academic facade is developed. So as you can see, the lower level has a shaded arcade that provides pedestrian connectivity between buildings. We have this in the JJ campus as well, right? And you know how successful that is. This is a very good strategy to move from outdoor to indoor through a protective environment. And uh, that is one of the key things in our kind of climate. Now the upper stories 
uh, actually have a layering of the facade, which creates a transition from open to naturally ventilated to air conditioned spaces. And it reduces the heat gain in the buildings. As you see here, uh, the Jali is an identifying element in the campus. This also came about because we studied the role of Jalis in traditional buildings. And we realized that Jalis provide shading indoors and they help reduce the temperature in a building very gradually. This is very important for buildings in extreme weather where the body needs time to adapt as one moves from outside to inside. So we created a parametric design of our own to create the Jali pattern that we wanted. We tested this design over different materials to see what is most feasible in construction and maintenance. And the Jali that we have now developed, this is a water cut Jali in sandstone. The other elements are uh, towers and nodes. So on the central green mall at either ends, we have two towers that become the bookends to the central open space. Along the length of the open space, uh, we have these turrets, which are essentially building cores, where staircases and stuff. And they become nodes on the open space. These nodes provide a break in the main facade and they are also located such that they are pause points for entries, for lobbies, for cross connections in the campus, etc. The arrival experience. Now for the arrival, what we wanted to do is to bring about this entire design vision of the Indian aesthetic, its contemporary interpretation, and the materiality to engage visitors who are coming in. We wanted it to be human in scale and yet feel grand in some way. So this entrance space was carefully crafted with a jali box uh, that invites people in. And this creates a vista over the green uh, central mall from where one can see the entire campus at a glance. Once this vocabulary was set and we had to take it forward to the next campus, what we wanted to do was to uh, identify elements that are important to us, but not repeat the vocabulary. We wanted the design of the new campus to have its own feel and identity. So some of the, the main elements of this campus were the Jati the brick, which creates a fine texture over the facades, and a very sparing and judicious use of glazing. We took these elements and uh, adopted them and applied them to the next campus. So this is a view of the east facade where the academic buildings face the street. Here you see the Jali boxes uh, appear uh, on the facade. There is a lower level shaded arcade, which was important to stay um, uh, connected through various buildings in a protective environment. The residential buildings are done very much in brick, like the South Campus. But what you see in the inset here is that we try to translate our learnings from sustainability studies to provide a facade that breathes and allow airflow and transitions to happen very gradually from the outdoor space to the indoors. In this campus, we are also introducing uh, a new element on facades, interiors, and other parts of biophilia. We wanted to integrate landscape elements more closely with the building and with the users, as it helps in well-being, productivity, and also creates a microclimate. It's very important for a weather uh, as Sonipat has because it also gets dust storms during the summers. Now, the most efficient way to deal with dust storms is landscape, as landscape with vegetation and uh, its density can mitigate the effects of dust storms very easily. 
So a campus, as we know, is where we spend most of our precious years. We get education. We learn life skills. We meet the best of our friends. We have the best of our memories. Now, what helps us create this sense of place in the campus is something we look at very closely. One of the ways we do that is that we study the ground floor plan of the entire campus very closely to see how indoor outdoor connections of buildings work how spaces look out into the open spaces and how indoor spaces can connect from one to the other where can we have spaces of gathering where can we have spaces of respite where can we have spaces of events so one such example is the mess lawns the mess lawn this name itself has been given to the place by the community. This space was designed by us in the first phase itself and was planned around a variety of functions like classrooms, dining, library, administration offices. So this gives an opportunity for everyone in the campus to come out to this place. We kept this space protected as the campus was growing and soon the community took ownership of it. So as you can see, individuals and groups on a day-to-day -day basis use this in many different formats. It is used as a spill out for the dining, it is used for events, it is used for gatherings, it is used for everything that they want to do on a good day outdoors. Similarly, another space uh, is the arrival courtyard which has a mix of functions surrounding it and overlooking it. This space as well has become a space for fairs, for open house, welcoming visitors and other such events. So the idea I'm trying to convey here is as designers, we can create a place by planning and designing it with the right mix of ingredients. You can have the right functions, you can provide the right scale, form to it but it really comes alive when communities own it and animate it with their own uses. And that is a very happy moment for us as designers. So over the past decade, we have seen how the campus has grown and how people have developed a sense of belonging to this place. This sense of belonging, this ownership also helps us in design. We work very closely with students, faculty, project teams, administration teams, founders, donors to understand their requirements. We do pre and post occupancy surveys to capture how they feel in spaces. How do, how do they respond to some of the design strategies we are bringing in? And where we can work further to improve our programming or design sensibilities to cater to their needs. So this is Ashoka University. This is work done over the past decade. Many people from our office have been involved in this project, both currently and in the past, and have contributed a great deal to the success of this project. We have a great client, and a great team of consultants who we work very closely with and who inspire us to keep pushing design boundaries at every step. Thank you. We can pause here for a bit, take a few questions on this if we'd like to. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and I also have a few people I know from Ashoka University and they really like their campus. It was very interesting to uh, Oh, that's fantastic. Good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so in the audience, if anyone wants to ask any questions based on this presentation, we can have a few of those and then go ahead with Tanya ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Um, really nice presentation. I would like to ask a question. Um, uh, so my question was, as seen in the design of this particular university, there, will, there was a contemporary 
interpretation of um, you know indian architecture in the design so how important you think um, is this particular design process to be adapted in um, in design process you know in general specifically in this age of uh, you know copy culture of uh, i mean if you look at many buildings in india or in asia or in europe they have lost their character which was you know uh, connected to their own country or their culture so how important do you think this particular attribute of design is i think it's very important um or rather i think it is the way to be um you are right um you know um buildings are becoming generic because it th there's a deep down reason why buildings are becoming generic right from the fact that you know globalization and product development has gone to another level so any product any material uh, any facade technology could be made available in any part of the world but what that has done is that has made us ape uh, uh design uh, strategies from another part of the world to uh, some other part where it may or may not be relevant so uh, what i would think uh, and what is important for all of us as designers is to respect the context we need to design in the context we are in we need to design uh, in the weather uh, in the climate that we live in uh, we need to design for the people who would be using it um because buildings uh, become identities uh you know you want to identify with the building with the campus so i think that that kind of um uh, uh response to context is very important for us we were very fortunate because the client came with this understanding and sensitivity so this was actually part of the design brief for us they said you know we don't want glass looking buildings that could be anywhere in the world we are building a university in india for the future of india and we want it to be indian but it is a university in the 21st century you know so everything that the university has in terms of systems in terms of spaces in terms of technology is all of the century all looking forward um but it's still rooted in india it is it's very much which is why in the design process we started looking at local materials the sandstone that you're seeing here which is made uh, which the jali is made of this is all locally sourced we did not want to have materials coming from you know another part of the world or anything of that sort so we tried to use local materials get local workmanship do things locally everything is simply done there's no a uh, complicated um uh, you know a uh, procedure of doing any of these things most of our workmanship is uh, and um uh, the construction community is very local so we wanted to keep things simple things that can be built because sometimes you know you make a complicated design and then even to build it you need to like get that kind of expertise right even that doesn't serve the purpose so i think it's really important and we try to respond to that always yes ma'am absolutely um one more question i had was uh, it's not actually a question i wanted to ask uh, this personally that um, looking at the uh, large scale firms like per perkins eastman um uh, they you have guys have worked like everywhere in the world right so it's like uh, you have an outlook all over the world on how buildings are designed all over so how do you think is the global culture of you know um designing buildings you know i mean how is the approach different in different countries different in different uh, contexts uh, can you give some insights on uh, your own uh, you know experiences in finding that out um yeah that's a good question so i think um certain things are similar like um we do design buildings that are 
very program centric and people centric so you know this entire uh, part of programming that i explained is something that we would do whether it's a healthcare project uh, whether it is uh, an educational project as this one or a k to 12 school or any other kind of building type programming is important and that's something we do but programming is also cultural right uh, because as i showed you the different kind of spaces that go into a higher education campuses yes the components may be the same but culturally they could be very different the way we would design dining spaces in india versus the way we would do it in middle east or versus the way we would do it in uh, us could be really different because culturally it's different so i think that's where our teams respond to culture and that's where uh, uh, the differentiating factor is and of course the second differentiating factor what we spoke of earlier is the climate and the context uh, many things in ashoka are done because it is a remote location because it is a greenfield campus uh, and uh, then we respond to those kind of things if this was a campus within a city or it was a brownfield development we would have taken different decisions we would have done things differently you know for instance you know uh, i spoke of dining and how you know food is a big thing you want multiple options because students have nowhere else to go so they need different kind of options in a city that is not the case right you can step out and you can go to a starbucks you can get a subway you have all those things so so i think context is really important so um so i think culture and context to answer your question what we do differently in projects in different parts of the world what is similar is programming uh is trends we try to look forward we try to see um how uh, a particular building type uh, is responding to um and where is it headed towards like you know research is becoming very digital um uh, lab spaces are changing more from wet lab to collaborative labs that are more interdisciplinary so so those kind of trends that are come up in each practice areas those are applied you know irrespective of where we are doing a project um uh, and those stay constant and how we arrive at those we arrive at those because one we are working in different parts of the world and second we do a lot of research and dialogue with uh faculty with doctors with researchers people who are actually working in the field so architecture in some way as designers we cannot be siloed in our profession because eventually we are designing for users who are of different professions so we need to understand where is their profession going towards what are the things that they are leaning towards and design for that i hope i've answered your question yes ma'am uh, it was very it is very interesting to look at things on such a massive scale i think that very well uh, answers my question thank you so much thank you uh shruti let's move to tanya's presentation then we can take more questions towards the end yes sure ma'am uh tanya ma'am if you can go ahead sure just going to share let me know if you are able to see the screen yes you can see it you'll just have to go on the slide show yeah. perfect good evening everyone my name is tanya and i am a graduate from jj batch of 2001 i have been with perkins eastman for about 10 years now in my overall experience of about 20 years of practice i have worked with various project types and have now come to find my focus in uh, health wellness and lifestyle i enjoy writing and have published two articles on senior living one is urban footprint published in my livable cities which addresses the need for intergenerational housing for seniors within an urban environment and dwelling with dementia published with silver talkies which talks about adapting the living space to meet the needs of a senior with the early onset of dementia At Perkins Eastman, I championed the Mumbai office 
through the firm-wide mentoring program to help support the individual and develop their career interests. I lead the healthcare and senior living practice in India. And outside of work, I have a family with three wonderful children. Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the design for senior living, focusing on what's important and the design drivers. I will also share a few projects done in India. As we age, we constantly rethink our lifestyle to stay active, engaged, and inspired. Never slowing down. The design of senior living considers the impact of, of the physical environment on multiple dimensions of wellness, physical, spiritual, emotional, financial, intellectual, environmental, and social. The design aims to provide a lifestyle that promotes physical and emotional well-being, inspires creativity, promotes positive interaction, reduces stress and mental fatigue, reduces agitation in dementia care, reduces chronic pain and influences the sleep cycles, circadian rhythms. The practice of senior living is a special housing type overlaid with a care model managed by an operator. The type of care imparted depends on the level of acuity of the resident, which further defines the type of senior housing. Today, these are some of the categories of senior housing that we see. Active adult communities, which are for residents above 55 years of age, independent living, adult daycare, assisted living, memory support, short-term rehabilitation, long-term care, and hospice. Active adult communities is for the older adult above about 55 years of age, perhaps still in the workforce and choosing to reside within a senior living community. These communities are usually well integrated in the local urban community. Independent living is for the young senior citizen who is still very independent and mobile and is able to move about within the larger community at will. Adult guest care is a day care service for seniors. We find in many households today, grandparents living with the family. If the grandparent starts to show signs of cognitive issues, or you may need assistance through the day, the adult of the household that may go to work can drop off the senior at an adult guest care center for the day. Assisted living. The older senior who may need mobility assistance and or is starting to have any cognitive or memory issues will need a certain level of staff or nurse oversight through the day. These residents typically stay within an assisted living facility. Memory support, one of my personal favorites. Memory support facilities are especially designed for seniors with dementia. The facility is designed to allow the resident to wander under a controlled physical environment with access to an outdoor garden to prevent eloping, what we call as wandering off. The interiors is designed with no dead ends, which can be unnerving to someone with dementia. Activated nooks are interspersed along the circulation corridor to keep the resident engaged and mentally active. Special sensory rooms are sometimes set up to help stimulate a resident who may be in a stupor or calm someone down that is over agitated. Wayfinding cues like memory boxes located at each resident's door help the resident identify with their rooms. The memory box usually contains souvenirs from the resident's past. Household models. The small house model applies to both assisted living and memory care, where a particular household is defined by a grouping of a smaller number of residents within a larger senior living community, creating a smaller family slash social environment that, we share, that will share meals and a social experience. Short-term rehabilitation caters to the senior that may need rehabilitation after a surgery or an illness. These are usually integrated within a large senior living community. Long-term care provides rehabilitative care for seniors with chronic pain 
and illness. Before we look at some of our projects, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the design drivers for senior living. Uh, community connections, holistic wellness, resilience, that is sustainability, aging in place, tailoring the experience for the individual, and the importance of interior details. Community connections, creating senior housing in livable communities, providing easy access to local markets, public amenities, and the community at large. This will allow the independent senior to stay active and continue to contribute to society, giving them a continued sense of fulfillment and the choice of an active lifestyle. Can we explore the possibility of a mixed use development for seniors with housing and retail above a transit station? The image to the right is an example of co-housing in Oregon. Co-housing is an intentional community of private homes clustered around a shared space. The term originated in Denmark in the late 1960s. Each attached single family home has the traditional amenities, including a private kitchen. Holistic wellness, providing access to amenities that support holistic wellness. For example, an exercise pool for hydrotherapy, a gymnasium designed especially for seniors and access to therapeutic gardens. Resilience and sustainability. Many indoor environments have a higher pollutant level than outdoor levels due to occupant activity, building materials and ambient conditions. Designing a building with the appropriate choice of building materials, low VOCs and green cleaning products will help achieve higher indoor air quality. Orienting the building to take advantage of the sun's natural movement, the use of natural plants and landscape strategies to minimize irrigation, providing photovoltaic cells, photovoltaic panels to capture solar energy, selecting low flow water fixtures and recycling gray water from site. Tailoring the experience to the individual. The image you see on the left here is a photograph of the Hogaway Dementia Village in the Netherlands. Here, the traditional nursing home has been deinstitutionalized, transformed and normalized. It is operated by nursing home operator Hogway and is a gated community. It has been designed specifically as a pioneering care facility for elderly people with dementia. Caregivers, doctors, and nurses work around the clock to provide the, the 152 residents the necessary 24 hour care. Hogway is designed as a normal residential area so that residents feel they are living normal everyday lives. They go shopping at the supermarket, get together with family and friends in the cafe and the restaurant, and they participate in clubs. People with dementia have difficulty in making sense of the world around them. It makes them anxious, sad, or aggressive. They would otherwise live in a traditional nursing home in a closed ward. Hogway provides safety to the severely demented so they can feel at peace in familiar surroundings. Residents are stimulated to live normal lives. They can forget the misery of dementia. The image in the middle is a photograph at Aegis, a senior living facility in Seattle. Here, the local market, Pike Street, was recreated within the memory support facility to create a familiar environment for the residents. The last image on the right is an example of tailoring the experience for the residents by providing flexibility within their unit to express their interests, creating a space that gives them a sense of self. Aging in place, another very important concept. Designing the interior space to be adaptable, to allow for the addition of support equipment in the unit as the senior ages, like grab bars in the toilets, handrails, equipping the resident with smarter systems to connect with a caregiver in case of an emergency. For seniors that start to develop memory and other cognitive issues, the unit can be designed to be adaptable to allow these residents to continue to live at home, providing areas for activity, connections to the outdoors, 
the partner or the caregiver should have a visual connection with the senior that needs to be cared for at all times. Interior details. Focusing on the finer details for this frail and sensitive group makes for a comfortable home. For example, including handrails in hallways, providing emergency pull cords in bathrooms in case of slips and falls, wheelchair accessible tables and chairs to enable the resident to be independent. It is important to minimize slips and falls, which is one of the top reasons for injuries. Providing emergency call systems integrated into the residential units in case of emergencies. Indoor air quality, acoustics, lighting are all very important aspects of design for senior living. Now I'd like to walk you through two of our projects that we have done in India. The Virtuoso is planned as the first of many of Columbia Pacific independent living communities in India. Columbia Pacific is a Seattle-based senior living operator. Starting in Bangalore, this project is set in Budigiri, conveniently located from the Bangalore Central Business District and is located amidst other residential development. This project has been designed with reference to both the NBC, National Building Code Standards for Accessibility, and ADA, the American Disability Act, for buildings and facilities. It is also designed to meet vast new standards. The site and its landscape are fully accessible with walkways connecting the parking to the lobby. Accessible parking is located very close to the lobby entrance. There are dedicated pedestrian routes and crossings clearly indicated with flooring patterns, markings, and tactile surfaces. The site lighting has been designed to facilitate wayfinding. Sustainability is an important element of the building's design with rooftop solar panels, rainwater harvesting, and organic waste composition. Studies have shown that people exposed to restorative environments and or views of nature show immune enhancing effects. At Virtuoso, the outdoor spaces offer places for contemplation as well as activities such as swimming, gardening, movies, grilling, lounging, yoga, Aquatherapy is considered to be one of the best forms of exercise, especially for people who suffer from connective tissue problems, joint disorders, or arthritis. The 15 meter swimming pool located on the rooftop podium of Virtuoso supports aquatic activities such as water aerobics, pool walking, lap swimming, and therapy. The club also offers residents a pool face facing gymnasium with equipment specially selected for seniors. The space also allows for group exercises for therapy. A spa is provided for relaxation. A wellness center is provided for senior focused services, including screening, assessments, or consultation. The rooftop garden. Providing seniors access to the outdoors for exercise and respite is very important. On sites such as this, where land is a premium and limited, we make use of the rooftop to provide outdoor amenities like a jogging track, a swimming pool, therapeutic gardenings, and areas for relaxation. Accessible community gardens located on the podium include raised bed planters, which are specially designed for someone in a wheelchair to access. Apart from being an enjoyable form of exercise, gardening promotes social interaction, mobility, and flexibility, as well as improves well being. The jogging track has benches located at intervals for rest. These are some of the amenities that you will see that are shared amongst residents within the community. The amenities, along with the care provider, provided by the operator are some of the fundamental differentiators between a senior living community and a typical apartment building. Some of the amenities provided here are a living room, a bistro, a library, a health clinic for checkups and medical emergencies, 
the main dining, a gymnasium, and a spa. Shared amenities encourage residents to come out of their apartments, socialize, and participate in exercise and other group activities. This keeps them physically and mentally active. Providing opportunities to socialize eliminates isolation. Isolation is known to lead to depression and other chronic illnesses. Interior finishers are specially selected to create a luxury home-like experience. The furniture and particular choice in fabrics are designed and selected to be easily maintained and are appropriate for an older adult. Lighting is designed to provide an ambient environment and additionally meets the necessary lux levels for seniors. The residential units have been designed to be adaptable where someone can age in place. Here's a look at the kitchen. The kitchens have been designed for someone in a wheelchair to reach the countertop, to reach the overhead cabinets. There's an accessible panel provided under the sink. So while in a wheelchair, you would not hurt yourself with a bottle trap. The bathrooms have been designed so that someone can age in place and grab bars and other support, necessary support equipment can be included as someone ages. Emergency pull cords have been included in the bathroom in case of an emergency. The choice of faucets is also very important. So someone with arthritis who has stiff fingers can operate. Usually the faucets which are round or have knobs or uh, complicated handling is very difficult for an old person with arthritis to use. So simple, sleek uh, faucets are important. Antara. Antara is another project that we have completed in Dehradun. It is a senior living community situated at a scenic destination set in the lush mountains on a 14 acre land parcel. This is a project for the Max Group and is like a second home to most residents. Essential to creating a harmonious synergy between the nat natural landscape and the built environment, this new senior living community framed by the Himalayas and the verd verdant green river promises a life of prosperity and well being for residents. The community's program includes 215 independent living apartments clubhouse, wellness center, and support spaces organized around the east-west axis of the main vehicular and pedestrian road. The clubhouse entry at the west axis creates a sense of arrival for visitors and residents and serves as a threshold for dramatic views to the mountains and the valley beyond. A second phase will add a health center, shelled nurse, nursing beds, and apartments for physical and cognitive frail seniors. The design recognizes the importance of preserving the main road with the existing trees on both sides. This avenue of trees is the main pedestrian entrance, which brings residents and visitors to an existing temple. Vastu principles of design, layout, measurement, ground preparation, space arrangement, and geometry have all guided the design process. The architecture is minimal yet beautiful Courtyards and open spaces between buildings allow for relaxation and social interaction between residents. A network of pedestrian pathways connects every resident, every building, generating an extensive range of walking alternatives with varying degrees of incline and physical effort levels for residents. This is a contoured site. Seating and rest areas are provided along the way. Each building is about three to four stories high and four units per floor, dividing the larger community into smaller subgroups. The residential units are large and luxurious. The larger units are over 2,000 square feet. The residential units have a panic alarm for emergencies. They are designed for someone in a wheelchair to maneuver independently with anti-skid flooring to prevent slips and falls. 
The large windows maximize views and light from the outside. A dedicated space for domestic help is provided within the unit with a separate entrance which connects to the kitchen and the utility area. The clubhouse and wellness center is at the heart of the community. It serves in, as an extension to their home, a place to meet, interact, learn, and pamper oneself. It accommodates dining spaces, eating out verandas, fine cuisine restaurants, card rooms, a bar, library, art and craft studio, theater, indoor games room, indoor heated pool. The clubhouse also has areas for well-being, such as a salon, spa, gym, yoga, and a health bar. Antara has an integrated and holistic approach to their wellness with a strong preventative healthcare program. They also have the ability to care for residents at their units. These are some of the shared amenities for the residents to enjoy. The spaces have been planned in a manner that allow both for private as well as shared activities. The design approach combines the state-of-the-art engineering and local materials woven together with a light and fresh contemporary expression. All the areas in the facility have the option of being temperature controlled or naturally ventilated depending on the weather and the use. Most areas have an attached veranda space for in indoor and outdoor use. Special attention has been given to materials, colors, finishes, to support residents with physical, physical challenges and age-related needs. All amenities are designed with a focus on physical and visual comfort, access, ergonomics, and circulation. Antara. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that presentation. It's something that we've all, I think, as students been looking at for the first time. So it was very interesting to see, uh, especially the different studies that you had to do for uh, senior living uh, design. So yes, if anyone has any questions, we can have one or two and then we have a, another discussion coming. Hello, uh, this is Sushma Zoglikar here. Yeah, nice, nice presentation and congratulations. And uh, good that, you know, our students are doing, you know, so well. And uh, particularly, you know, uh, uh, understanding the situation and designing as per the, you know, uh, for in, in uh, using Indian materials and using a kind of, you know, straight, uh, you know, rectangular kind of things. And it is not necessary that when you are designing, you have to have like, you know, Google approach and, you know, you have to have modernistic and, you know, using glass and kind of things. So the way you, you know, you are presented, you are designed and I appreciate and very nice to, you know, have you back uh, to the college. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. It's so nice to hear from you after so many years. You know. Thank you so much for joining our talk. Any questions from the students? I think everyone's shy. Also, I think between the two practice areas, they were quite diverse. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to share these with you. It also mm -hmm. shows a, a, a diversity of uh, practice that you could get involved in as architects and how you could develop your interests and focuses. So, uh, you know, there are other very interesting collaborations uh, that are coming about across the world between practice areas. Um, the word that we use is called convergence, where uh, practice areas come together. Uh, and it's very interesting, taking just these two examples of higher education and senior living. Um, we see a few examples in Europe where we see um, 
some cases of what is called as intergenerational senior living, uh, giving seen within academic environments. And what that does for seniors is that it gives them the opportunity to stay academically connected, stay engaged in uh, programs, cultural events, college lectures. And uh, there's a whole group of seniors uh, that may enjoy this, retired faculty, people that want to, faculty that want to stay connected with an academia at a certain level, that may choose uh, and actually enjoy senior living within an academic setting. And these are actually quite successful models in Europe. Um, and we hope that the next generation of designers uh, starts to think a little bit more about convergence and bringing together uh, practice areas. Um, senior living is something new uh, to a lot of people, uh, but more and more we understand that seniors aren't aging, they're getting younger and want to stay involved and more integrated in society. And there are several creative ways of uh, providing care uh, for seniors within mixed use developments, within uh, academic settings, um, you know, and um, creating wonderful projects for the community. Yes, ma'am, I do have seen a few um, senior living residential areas in my city but none of them were as lively as the one that you described and so yeah it was interesting to know about it i think the students might not have Hello. any questions you. yeah okay sorry uh, yeah thank you uh, yeah so uh, it was really great presentation and i really enjoyed the presentation uh, i had a, a, a small question about uh, uh, campus designing actually as we are in third year doing uh, campus designing uh, so basically what we uh, at the stage we are in right now is we have lots of ideas lots of sketches and uh, lots of brainstorming but uh, we are not finding a way how to put it on actual uh, something that could be constructed something that can create the effect that we want so there are lots of thinking and sketching but then uh, uh, I would like to hear from you how you funnel all the thoughts in that one structure. I have thought all those things and now how those will be built and actually executed and after the uh, after it's ready, how people can interact with that building. Hi, so uh, let me try to answer your question. Um, so I, I'm not sure what kind of campus you're designing, whether it's uh, uh, educational. Uh, it's on a, uh, it's institutional, it's for a museum, it's on a contoured land. Okay. Um, so, well, um, see the process of design of a campus design uh, typically is, uh, you know, you like, like I was showing, you do multiple options. Now, how do you derive at these options? Options are derived uh, at looking at various uh, parameters. And one of them is uh, how people would move into the space. In your case, a museum. So, you know, there are a lot of visitors. So, uh, how does the entry experience work? How does the circulation work? There could be a lot of tourist buses that come in. So where do they park? What is that first vista or the first view that they get of the museum that they want to look at? Um, you know, how do they then uh, from their drop off or where they are left off arrive towards the building? Uh, what is your building? Is it one form? Is it a complex with courtyards, you know, like Gandhi Ashram is uh, that Charles Correa had designed? Uh, so the museum itself could be done in many ways, right? Um, the trend in museum design that we're seeing these days is um, uh, displays are changing, displays are no longer static, displays are interactive, uh, displays uh, are, um, are experiential, uh, you could touch and feel them. So unlike older museums where you had a static display, uh, that's no longer the case. 
um and um so you know you want to take into account some of those things um uh, which is where the trends and the future of anything is going i think we are all at that cusp of um you know where um design is getting influenced by so many other things right there's technology there's experiences there's social media design gets influenced by all these things so you may want to look at these aspects and then see uh, how you create um uh, create your uh, campus design based on that uh, i would recommend doing case studies um, um case studies are uh, really helpful uh, in one understanding the trends how displays uh, are changing or in museums back of house is very important and a large component of design is back of house you may have galleries and exhibitions that are um, that are permanent but museums also have collaborations with other museums around the world and there are uh, displays and galleries that keep changing right so back of house is really important how does uh, art work from somewhere else come in and how does it uh, reach its display how would it be taken off packed up shipped off again uh, all these are also um uh weather controlled spaces a lot of artifacts and displays want to be weather controlled uh, but sustainability of course is a paramount factor i think uh, one thing that i tell students um, as often as i can is that um, we being designers in this century don't have sustainability as an option to us anymore sustainability Uh, has to be incorporated in design at every stage climate change is real i mean we can see it all around us so our designs have to respond uh, to climate have to be sustainable uh, so i would suggest looking at some of those parameters so right from your passive techniques how i showed you about building orientation solar heat gains uh, your wind movements human comfort um are all very important sustainability parameters that go into campus design so i would think your options want to uh, you know cater to all these aspects um and that's how you would derive your campus plan uh, yes thank you so much and yeah that's a really good point that Uh, museums are not any more based on visuals now the spectrum has been expanded so yeah Uh, thank you thank you so much good evening chavi and uh, tanya i am uh, kalyani mukhasdar their uh, ad faculty for third year so and they are doing campus design so especially when your talk started i checked the list of participants and there were very few third year rights uh, i saw and i immediately put the message on the a group that uh, uh, lots of uh, interesting things which you would be looking at are happening please join and i think a uh, few of them have joined after that and uh, indeed uh, your uh, all your projects all the three projects which you showed were basically user centric right that's right and uh, that experience that's what and uh, the nice part is that uh, all the students of third year at present are doing museum design but the type of museum we've given them the liberty you can choose your type so mm-hmm. somebody is doing aerospace and somebody is doing war museum and somebody is doing botany museum so experience for each and every student is like different the type of exhibits and all and what all you said was already uh, discussed again i mean it's like they are uh, getting the same summary from many experienced people also we've done uh, 11 indian and 11 uh, uh, international museum case studies in the class That's so fantastic. only thing is uh, suddenly at the third year level after second year 
they are doing uh, lots of uh, community i mean things spaces for community mm-hmm. till second year the crowd is uh, limited for which for whom they design um, but at the end of the day it's user centric so uh, you have to break it up into parts at some place when you have to finally decide the that's what was very nicely exhibited and presented in your uh, presentations so uh, i like them very much thank you very thank much you. thank you thank you so much happy happy women's day also happy women's day the same <laughs> yeah feeling very proud when uh, women have uh, uh, successfully handled such nice big projects and all so and now uh, nowadays the trend has happened that in a class 70% girls are there 30% boys are there so those girls need to really decide and determine that yes we are going to start a practice and uh, Uh, use our uh, education and knowledge and uh, become successful like yours <laughs> absolutely that's that's really important uh, yeah they all you know, have to come out and practice yes yes wish you all all the best thank you very much thank, thank you so much thank you kalyani ma'am uh, since kalyani ma'am has brought about the topic of women's day and this is something that uh both of our speakers had wanted to be a topic of discussion later so we're going to have a small discussion about uh practicing women as architects in the field so i'll be asking ma'am chavi ma'am and tanya ma'am a few questions and then later on all the other ladies can join in into the discussion uh so uh, one of the main questions as kalyani ma'am said that we have a lot of uh girls in fact we have more uh, girls studying in architecture colleges than boys now but uh, as it's obvious you don't see the same numbers reflected in practice so uh, why do you think that is and what do you think we can do to bridge that gap well uh, i can answer that i think uh, having a family of my own i kind of recognize where some this issue uh, a lot uh as see some of my peers experiencing the same challenges and most women often get caught up in the balance finding a balance between the home life uh and their careers and uh both are equally demanding and equally important uh for the woman and for yourself and a lot large number of women tend to drop out of their practice uh, when they you know choose to start a family but it doesn't have to be either or uh it can be both because um i think the key is to find the right balance and uh, even when your family is young you stay connected with the profession in some capacity that you can whatever capacity that you can uh, even if it's part time or it could be um writing or doing research or maintaining your connection with the professional field uh, and then later ramp back up into uh, the profession when you're ready and have a little bit more breathing room um but i i think that that seems to be one of the biggest uh, you know challenges that women think that there is uh, but uh, it's just something that you once you set your mind to and you find an interest in what you do um, you'll find a way to move through it yes that's true thank you so much oh, this ma'am, problem ma'am. shruti actually this is not specific to india this is a worldwide issue where um, uh, for architecture that the number of women in the profession and who uh, you know uh, grow into leadership roles is much lesser and um, and it is like tanya is saying you know there is you need to sort of stay engaged you need to stay connected Mm, women of course need a support system right you need support from family from colleagues from organizations and so i think uh one part of it is what we as women can do ourselves and the other part of it is how do we sensitize the environment around us to make them aware of uh, 
of the challenges that uh, come about uh, in a woman's career trajectory and how they can all sort of contribute to the growth of a woman's career. Yes, ma'am, as you said, it's, it's seen globally, even for us when we're doing, say, a case study for a museum. Most of the names that we see associated with any project, I've hardly seen that a woman architect is leading a project. And I guess that sort of role model um, factor is also missing for a lot of us who are studying right now. So did you, I mean, I'm sure you also faced that when you were a student. So uh, has that, did that change the way you, did that make you feel like, you know, you were to say lesser or to reduce your confidence in any way? Like not having a woman role model, is that what you're- Somewhat, yes. Asking? Actually, in my career, people were very supportive of uh, whoever I had, and um, I've had, I've, I've, I've had, actually had quite a few women working with me throughout my career. So, uh, I guess I was fortunate that way, and to stay inspired. There are women in the workforce. <laughs> <laughs> So our next question was that did you personally, not apart from family, but did you face any uh, problems being a woman in while working with your colleagues or with, say, while working on site and things like that? Uh, yes, uh, I think it's a constant uh, struggle. It's a constant uh, challenge as to how we make that place for ourselves uh, in the workplace. Uh, you know, everything from, uh, I mean, essentially uh, architecture at school may be a more women-centric field, but construction, especially in India, is a male-dominated industry, right? So you walk into a meeting and the client is like, sorry, are you the one presenting? Like, you know, I've had that myself, like, really? Have you come for this meeting? Or clients saying um, to my seniors that, oh, is she the one who's going to manage our project? Like without even knowing what my capability is. At my face in front of me, you know. Um, uh, uh, but I think that is where I would say that um, organizational support, uh, support from uh, colleagues, from the firm, uh, for me has been some immense. I, I think uh, everybody around me has helped me grow a lot. So mm -hmm. when there have been times when a client would say, oh, is she's the one managing the project? There has been someone on my side saying, yes, she is. Mm -hmm. So can you continue talking to her? Or uh, there have been times when we would go to construction sites um, and have problems because contractors are not listening to you you know, uh, or uh, people are not listening to you. In those times, I would uh, definitely say clients have said, no, you know, she is the architect. And so I think everybody, everybody has a role to play. Clients have played that role, uh, you know, uh, the firm, our leaders, our mentors, all of them have played that role uh, in bringing us up to where we are. For, for my own self or for anyone else, if I have to say, is don't let these kind of judgments or biases undermine your own confidence. If somebody is turning and telling you, oh, really, are you going to do this? Yeah, sure, I am going to do it. You know? <laughs> and you, one doesn't have to sort of you know, uh, prove a point. Your work speaks for itself. So, so don't let it undermine your confidence. And, uh, but, but it is a struggle. It is definitely a real struggle that everybody mm -hmm. goes through. Um, and you just have to wake up every day and do what you do. And that can happen only when you're passionate and you like what you do. So and if that's the case, you just keep going. <laughs> yes, ma'am, that's a good point. I hope that by the time we have to practice, we don't have to worry about having to prove ourselves. But Yes, it's really nice to see people like you in the industry. Tanya, do you have to say anything about them? Um, I think it can be a little bit intimidating, uh, you know, having uh, it uh, be a male-dominated uh, profession. But uh, the construction industry, I, I feel, 
but ultimately when you're good at what you do uh, the world will accept you and that's the bottom line that's right does anyone else from the audience want to pitch in otherwise i have a few more questions that i can ask but i think it would be nice to have a discussion yeah it would be good if hello ma'am yeah hi uh good evening ma'am myself rushikesh lunde i am a student from second year uh ma'am uh, we saw uh, your project of senior housing uh it was a very different kind of uh, project means uh, which we which is not so common for even more or uh, we don't think in that perspective it was uh, for a uh, prescribed uh, for a uh, some age group it was for some uh, certain age group and uh, as we know that the uh, city, senior citizens might be having some uh, mental instability we can say that living uh, away from their ch uh, children living away from their family so they might be uh, having some mental uh, instability and they might require some kind of support so how could a, uh, how could an architect uh, contribute in this thing mm -hmm. how an architect can help in giving the uh, mental support can provide the mental support to these uh, these uh, kind of people senior citizens so uh, generally uh, as architects uh, we try to design our spaces to be able to create enough of a uh, mental emotional physical stimulation for the individual so much so that what you do and how you do it keeps them engaged uh, most of these facilities and they enjoy themselves the idea is for them to have a better lifestyle at the at the senior living a uh, situation than they would living at home on their own or even sometimes with a family because the the people they are living with are probably too busy working or looking after children and don't have much time to uh, keep the the older adult engaged uh, act actively so the idea uh, for these uh, kind of senior living organizations is to create enough spaces uh, you know architecturally create um, gardens create uh, gymnasiums create multi purpose spaces design it so that uh, you know the senior who comes there actually is engaged mentally and emotionally and enjoys themselves now these places that said are not cut off from the family the family is free to come and visit uh, as and when uh, they please they can come and visit they can stay overnight uh, and you know that kind of interaction is still uh, allowed it's only those for those residents that have um the the residents that are able and independent are even allowed to go outside and visit their family or make a trip with a friend or go shopping it's the residents that have memory care issues or uh, cognitive issues that need to be uh, more uh, cared for in a more controlled environment uh, because it's dangerous for them to be out on their own um and so some of these uh, facilities even have um you know play equipment for grandchildren when they come and visit in the garden and uh, they would have open the swimming pool up to the family so things like that uh, to allow for uh, the constant relation the relationships uh, to remain and be kept um are how we can keep get the best of both worlds yes ma'am that answers my question thank you ma'am Okay, thanks, Mr. Shikesh. Do, do, does anyone have any more questions related to the uh, Women's Day issues? Yeah, we can. We, I would um, like to continue yeah. that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I would just like to talk about one thing. So we, my, uh, one of the speakers that we had previously was architect Mansi Sahu, and mm -hmm. she brought this point that, uh, like, to all of the, like, she had actually addressed all the women in the. audience and she said that we should always like try to start a strive for our seat at the table and like uh, i guess from what you also said i think that is one thing that as girls we should always keep in our mind and sort of fight for our you know uh, right to be at the place so yeah i would just like to agree with what you were saying yeah absolutely and um, 
we we know Mansi really well. Mansi is fantastic, uh, oh, and I agree you. with her. Um, so uh, yeah, she is right. Uh, I think, um, and that sort of ties back to what Tanya was saying earlier. When you're good at what you do, um, the world listens to you, right? So uh, even this, you know, the uh, the seat on the table thing. One, one uh, as women, we sort of tend to become a little, um, uh, I, you know, sometimes either accommodating or intimidated that we sort of tend to step back. No, I mean, we don't have to do that. And, and it's easier said than done. It takes time to get comfortable in your own skin. So fair enough, everybody can take their own time. Uh, but um, it's as simple as that, that when it is about what you do and you do it well, you would want to be the voice of that, you know? So, uh, and what I'm trying to say is that you may not be great at networking and, you know, being the, you know, uh, the star in the room and reaching out to everyone. But if you were told to, you know, stand up and present your work, you could do it really well because it's your work and you have full conviction in what you've done. And that itself is a starting point. That itself is a point that gives you the confidence of being yourself. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with that. It's and every step counts, right? Every um, every uh, sort of assertion, self-assertion, and um, gives you self-confidence, and it makes you get there. So don't let it push yourself back. Yes. Thank you for that. I think we had one more um, question. I'll read it out. Mm -hmm. So it said, how can architecture and design help on a holistic approach to gender equality? Would you have anything to say to that? Would you repeat the question? How can architecture and design help on a holistic approach to gender equality? Okay, so let me start. I think uh, if you look at uh, design or a space by itself, uh, a space is not for any gender, right? Um, and I'm, I'm coming at this more from an urban point of view. Um, what makes a space non-equitable could be its context, could be its adjacency, could be, uh, you know, where it's leading to or something like that. Like a simple example, if uh, a street is not lit well, a woman doesn't feel safe to walk there, right? So, so that's where I'm coming from, that there's nothing wrong with the street. Uh, just the mm -hmm. fact that it's not lit well mm -hmm. makes it uh, inequitable in that way. So I think... Uh, what, what makes uh, spaces uh, inequitable are uh, more these kind of factors that are um, context related, that are uh, driven by other uh, factors. In design itself, I think what makes design uh, inequitable would be um, could be rather uh, maybe socioeconomic factors. Maybe there are cases where uh, women are not so aware uh, or don't end up making decisions about say property or you know uh, uh, don't have a voice. Like if you look at community design uh, or a participatory design, you know there as well, the voice of women is, is much lesser. Uh, whereas women in a society uh, play a much greater role. They have much more sensitivity towards equitable design because they are looking at, um, at spaces for their children. They are looking at spaces for senior citizens. They, they can be much more sensitive to the needs of an equitable design. But do they have a voice? You know, what Ayushi said earlier, do they have the voice to be on the table and express that as a part of the design process? 
uh, not always. Uh, so, um, so I think, I think it's not the space itself uh, that is inequitable, but it's all these factors associated to the space or the design or the process that uh, that are not equitable. One of the things I have seen, uh, having worked abroad and having seen projects that are done uh, outside of India and in India as well, uh, uh, you know, providing for childcare support. You see that a lot of, uh, this is something that a lot, some of the larger corporates in India as well are starting to do. And uh, even large hospitals or large organizations where that provide daycare services or childcare support within the facility encourages women to get back to work soon after they have their children. Uh, you know, so those kind of facilities for women uh, make it easier, make it easier. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're seeing more and more of these, um, um, you know, in India as well and abroad. You know, if you're a school teacher, for example, you don't have the luxury of, uh, you know, or a college professor, you don't have the luxury of taking six months off because even though you, you can have the six months off, what are your students going to do? Uh, you know, you are so experienced with 40 years of experience, the school cannot survive without you. Mm -hmm. But when you have in the facilities actually provide, you know, opportunities for uh, uh, child care support, then you are more inclined to come back to work, even for young nurses and young doctors in hospitals, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they don't, they're called back to work immediately. Um, and it makes life a lot easier when you have these kind of facilities integrated into the architecture. And so in that sense, uh, making architecture responding to uh, being equitable to male and female, uh, you know, providing facilities like this will attract and keep both genders into the profession longer. Yeah, exactly, yeah. That answers the question very well, thank you. And ma'am, since you also mentioned that you've worked abroad, did you find it easier to work, say, in when you were outside than it is in India, or is it almost the same? Um, I don't know about easier. I think um, when you, uh, you'll have to rephrase the, what you mean by easier. No, I meant since we were talking in the context of a woman in architecture, I meant that oh, do uh, is that, it easier that, that, for a woman? No, I mean, I mean, it's hard to compare because I spent a certain generation of my life, a certain age in, in that country, in a different generation in this country. Uh, but I think my experience in both countries has been fairly successful. Uh, when I was uh, in, in North America, I was younger. Uh, I did not have children, but there culturally, there were a lot of women in the workforce. And so it seemed fairly equitable here. I am, I have a family, but I have, I work uh, in India, but uh, again, the company is very supportive. So uh, again, it's uh, in that sense, um, I don't see any challenges. So it's really, uh, you know, in terms of what you do, you still have to work hard or perhaps harder. Uh, because you need to juggle things. Um, but uh, if you're able to do your work then uh, and do a good job and still do justice to what you do, then I think um, uh, you should be good. Yeah, that's nice to know. Is there anyone else who wants to ask him? Or else maybe we can conclude the talk. Oh. So I would like to say, you know, uh, if we are concluding that, you know, congratulations to all of you in the Students Council. I was part of the Students Council as well when I was in college. Okay. And I used to, you know, uh, over these past few weeks, how you guys reached out and you all have been talking, we used to do exactly the same things. And it used to be so exciting to, you know, reach out to different people and, and then when an event is successful, you're so happy about it. So 
just those kind of memories were coming rushing back to me and you guys are doing a great job and like i said initially this webinar series has actually been great for all of us as well so you know just to reconnect and see all the good work out there so thank you so much you guys are fantastic thank you ma'am thank you so much that's a good word of encouragement for us to carry on yeah yeah please do it's it's really helpful All right i think we don't have anyone stepping up for a question so maybe we can end the conversation here it was great having you here and the women's day edition itself was something i was really looking forward to and it turned out very nicely so thank you so much for coming in thank you so much thank you so much it's a pleasure thank you. thanks for having us we hope that you continue relations with our college and we'd love to come yes. and visit your firm as well yeah absolutely i think once this pandemic situation ends we will resume our open house sessions and we would love to have you guys over you guys can just walk down right get get just a stone's throw away from you yes so definitely we would really like that to happen thank you tania thank you chavi thank you kalyani ma'am all right i think we can end here okay